Section 6 of The Maker of Rainbows. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Maker of Rainbows by Richard Le Gallien. Section 6. The Sleepless Lord. There was once a great lord. He was the lord of seven castles, and there were seven coronets upon his head. He was richer than he ever gave himself the trouble to think of. For, north, south, east, and west, the horizon even set no bounds to his estates. A thousand villages and ten thousand farms were in the hollow of his hand, and into his coffers flowed the fruitfulness and labor of all of these. Therefore, as you can imagine, he was a very rich lord. He had more beautiful titles, denoting the various principalities over which he was lord, than the deepest lung herald could proclaim without taking breaths at least three times. In person he was most noble and beautiful to look upon, and his voice was like the rippling of waters under the moon, save when it was like the call of a golden trumpet. He stood foremost in the councils of his realm, not only for his eloquence, but for his wisdom. Also God had given him a good heart. Only one gift had been denied him, the gift of sleep. By whatever means he might weary himself in the day, in study, in sport, in recreation, or in the business of his realm, Night found him sleepless, and in the dark hours the lights burned in his bedchamber and his library, as he would pace from one to the other with eyes tragically awake and brain torturingly alert and clear. Every means known to science by which to bring sleep to the eyes of sleepless men had been tried in vain. Learned physicians from all parts of the world had come to my lord's castle, and had gone thence, confessing that their skill had availed nothing. All strange and terrible drugs that have the power over sleep of man had failed to conquer those stubborn eyelids. My lord still paced from his bedchamber to his library, from his library to his bedchamber, sleepless. Sometimes in his anguish he had thrown himself on his knees in prayer before a god whom he had not always remembered, the god who giveth his beloved sleep. But his prayers had remained unanswered, and in the darkest moments he had dreamed of snatching by his own hands that sleep perpetual of which the great Latin poet he loved had sung. Often, as he paced his library, he would say over and over to himself, Nox es perpetua una dormidia. And in the still night, the old words would often sound like soft voices calling him away to the endless night of the endless sleep. But he was not the man to take that way of escape. No, whatever the suffering may be, he would fight it out to the end, and so he continued sleepless, trying this resource and that, but, most of all, that first and last resource, courage. It is seldom that courage fails to wrest for us some recompense from the hardest situation, and the sleepless man, as night after night he fought with his fate, did not miss such heart-wrung rewards. Often, as in the deepest hush of the night he wearily took up some great old book of philosopher or poet familiar to him from his youth, a sudden strange new light would shine out of his pages, as of some inner radiance of truth which he had missed in his daylight reading. At such times an exaltation would come over him, and he would almost seem as though the curse upon him was really a blessing of initiation into the world of deeper wisdom, the gate for which is hidden by the glare of the sun. In the daylight the eternal voices are lost in the transistory clamor of human business. It is only when the night falls and the stars rise and the noise of men dies down like the drone of some sleeping insect that the solemn thoughts of God may be heard. Other compensations he found when, weary of his books and despairing of sleep, he would leave his house and wander through the silent city, where the roaring thoroughfares of the daytime were silent as the pyramids, and the great warehouses seemed like deserted places haunted by the moon. Night walkers like himself grew to find his figure familiar, and would say to themselves, or to each other, There goes the Lord who never sleeps. And the watchmen on their rounds all knew and saluted the man whose eyelids never closed. Enforced as these nocturnal rambles were, they revealed to him much beautiful knowledge, which those more fortunate ones asleep in their beds must ever miss. Thus he came in contact with the vast nocturnal labor of the world, the toil of sleepless men who kept watch over the sleeping earth, and work through the night to make it ready for the newborn day. All that labor which is put away and forgotten with the rising of the sun, and for which the day asks no questions, so that the results be there. This brought him very near to humanity, and taught him a deep pity for the grinding lot of man. 
Then, was it no compensation for this sleepless one that he thus became a companion of all the ensorcelled beauty of night, walking by her side, a confidant of her mystic talk, as he gazed into her everlasting eyes? Was it nothing to be the intimate of her sublime moods, learned in every haunted murmur of her voice, entrusted with her lunar secrets, and a friend of all her stars? Yes, it was much indeed, he often said to himself, as he turned homeward with the first flush of morning, and met the great sweet-smelling wains coming from the country, laden with fruits and flowers, making their way like moving orchards and meadows to the city streets. The big wagoners, too, were well acquainted with the great lord, who never slept, and would always stop when they saw him, for it was his custom to buy from them a bunch of country flowers. The country dew is still on them, he would say, and will have long since dried, and the people sleeping yonder come to buy them. And, as he slipped back into his house, he would often feel a sort of pity for those who slept so well that they never saw the stars set and the sun rise. Such were some of the compensations for which he strove to strengthen his soul, not all in vain. So time passed, but at length the strain of these interminable nights began to tell upon the sleepless man, and strange fancies began to take possession of him. His vigils were no longer lonely, but inhabited by spectral voices and shadowy faces. Rebellion against his fate began to take the place of courage, and one day, in anger against his unending ordeal, he said to himself, Am I not a great lord? Is it intolerable that I should be denied that simple thing that which the humblest and the poorest possess so abundantly? Am I not rich? I will go forth and buy sleep. So saying, he took from a cabinet a great jewel of priceless value. It is worth half my estate he said, surely with this I can buy sleep, and he went out into the night. As if in irony, the night was unusually wide awake with stars, and the moon was almost as its full. As the sleepless one looked up into the firmament, it almost seemed as though it mocked him with his brilliant wakefulness. From horizon to horizon, in all the heaven, there was to be seen no downiest feather of the wings of sleep. To his upturned eyes, pleading for the mercy of sleep, the stars sent down an answer of polished steel. And so he turned his eyes upon the earth. Everything there also, even the keenly cut shadows, seemed piteously awake. It almost seemed as though God had withdrawn the blessing of sleep from his universe. But no, suddenly he gave a cry of joy, as presently, by the riverside, stretched in an angle of its granite embankment, as though it had been a bed of down, he came upon a great workman fast asleep, with his arms over his head and his face full in the light of the moon. His breath came and went with the regularity of a man who has done his day's work and is healthily tired out. He seemed to be drinking great draughts of the sleep out of the sky, as one drinks water from a spring. He was poorly clad, and evidently a wanderer on the earth. But houseless as he was, to him it had been granted that healing gift for which the Lord who gazed at him had prayed in vain for months and years, and for which this night he was willing to surrender half, nay, the whole of his wealth, if needs be. Only a little holiday of sleep, soft sleep, sweet sleep, a little soothing psalm, of slender from thy sanctuary's calm, a little sleep, it matters not how deep, a little falling feather from thy wing. Merciful Lord, is it so great a thing? The sleepless one gazed at the sleeper a long time, fascinated by the mystery and beauty of the strange gift that had been denied him. Then he took the jewel in his hand and looked at it, picturing to himself the sleeping man's surprise when he woke in the morning and found so unexpected a treasure in his possession, and all that the sudden acquisition of such wealth would mean to him. But, as I said in the beginning, God had given him a good heart, and, as he gazed on the man's sleep again, a pang of misgiving shot through him. After all, what were worldly possessions compared with this natural boon of which he was about to rob the sleeping man? Would all his castles be a fair exchange for that? And was he about to subject the fellow human being to the torture which he had endured to the verge of madness? For a long time he stood over the sleeper, struggling with himself. No, he said at last. I could not rob him of his sleep, and he turned and passed on his way. Presently he came to where a beautiful woman lay asleep with a child in her arms. They were evidently poor outcasts, yet how tranquilly they lay there, as if all the riches of the earth were theirs, and as if there was no hard world to fight on the morrow. If sleep had, been, had seemed beautiful on the face of the sleeping workman, 
how much more beautiful it seemed there, laying its benediction upon this poor mother and child. How trustfully they lay in its arms, out there in the shelterless night, as though relying on the protection of the ever-watchful stars. Surely he could not violate the sanctuary of sleep, and think to make amends by exchanging of his poor worldly possessions. No, he must go on his way again. But first he took a ring from his finger and slipped it gently into the baby's hand. The tiny hand closed over it with the firmness of a baby's clutch. It will be safe there till morning, he said to himself, and left them to their slumbers. So he passed along through the city, and everywhere were sleeping forms and houses filled with sleepers, but he could not bring himself to carry out his plan and buy sleep. Sleep was too beautiful and sacred a thing to be bought with the most precious stone, and man was so piteously in need of it at each long day's end. Thus he went on his way, and at last, as the dawn was showing faint in the sky, he found himself in a churchyard, and above one of the grains was growing a shining silver flower. It is the flower of sleep, said the sleepless one, and he bent over eagerly to gather it. But as he did so, his eyes fell upon an inscription in the stone. It was the grave of a beautiful girl who had died of heartbreak for her lover. I may not pluck it, he said. She needs her sleep as well. And he went forth into the dawn sleepless. End of section 6